feed on your flaws. They drain your time. And they never leave you alone. Hey, I need to run a few errands. Can you watch my dog? Again? Welcome to Discovery Church. So glad that you guys are here today for the final installment of our Relational Vampire series. We've been in this for four weeks. How many of you got some vampires living around you? Anyone got some vampires living around you? For those of you that don't know what we're talking about in this series, going, what's going on here? Where are the vampires at, man? Getting all freaked out. Look, a vampire, like in the movies, they suck the blood out of you, but a relational vampire is someone who sucks the life out of you. Like they, they suck the joy and the life, they kind of take from your life. And so what we're studying and learning is how do we live with, how do we, how do we love these people that God has called us to love? These, these, these people that take life from us, they draw out of us instead of add to our life. How do we love them yet still have healthy boundaries? How do we deal with these different personalities of people that, that fall into a relational vampire category. So in week one, we talked about the controlling person. How do we love and build boundaries with the controlling person or the critical person was week two. How do we deal with that? And then last week, Pastor Todd preached a phenomenal message on needy people. How do we, how do we love the, the needy but not, not let them take advantage of us or assume all of that upon ourselves? Today is, uh, I think, an, another relational vampire that every one of us has to learn how to engage with and what is our what's our role here the this vampire is the hypocritical person the hypocrite how many know any hypocrites anyone know any hypocrites here anyone yeah show of hands yeah how many of you have brought them with you you want bring them with you no, i'm just kidding don't raise your hand just look confused right now that's all you can do just look confused like i don't know what he's talking about okay that's that's better so what do we do though because the number one complaint of the church is what is the church is full of hypocrites that's the number one indictment against the church is that oh the church is just a bunch of hypocrites well that that yeah right i think that rightly so look we've uh, a lot of christians have have and churches have rightly given that title or that projection at least to a lot of people who are looking on the outside looking in saying that's just a bunch of hypocrites there but the word hypocrite it actually existed long before the church there is like hypocrisy existed before there were Christians, although some do it really well, and we're going to learn how to love them and what's our response to that. But the word hypocrite itself actually has its origin, check this out, has its origin in Greek theater. In the Greek theater, the hypocrite was actually an actor. It was the actor, a specific actor. It was the actor that wore the mask. The hypocrite was the actor that came out in the mask. See, outwardly he was projecting one thing, but inwardly he was someone else. That's what the hypocrite means. It means outwardly, I'm blessed and God bless you and everything's okay, but inside you're broken, you're lost. Outwardly, your marriage looks like it's fine and you're projecting like it's fine, but you're throwing around divorce every month. Outwardly, you're just, you're buying stuff, you're still shopping, but they're about to repossess your car. Okay, so, so this is the outwardly, we're projecting one thing, but inwardly, we're something different. We hide behind the mask. Jesus had a certain, um, I don't know, had a, he, he, he had a certain way about, uh, about this type of person. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't think very fondly. Let me just put it that way, of this type of person. There was actually, all, in Matthew chapter 23, there is seven different times where Jesus says, woe to the hypocrite, woe to the hypocrite. And here's what he says, that Outwardly, you look righteous, like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Like this, like this is engraved in humanity. Hypocrisy is, for anyone here, it's just like, maybe thinking that this is not your area or particular area of sin. This is engraved in humanity, you guys. This projecting one thing, but inwardly, it's, it's something different. Maybe even as a young kid, it started because your dad or someone told you, don't you cry. Don't you cry. Men don't cry. And so inwardly, you're broken and you want to shout, but you project an image of strength and control. 
fake it till you make it. Fake it, just, just act like it. And I'm telling you, it's just, it's, it's a hypocrisy. It's outwardly I'm one thing, but inwardly I'm something else. Look at Galatians chapter 6 says. It says, if anyone thinks they are something when they're not, they deceive themselves. See, the, the hypocrite does not just want to deceive you. The hypocrite's attempting to deceive themselves. See, because if I can just wear this mask good enough, if I can just wear this good enough, maybe if I can wear it long enough, this can become the me that I live. This, this can be, this maybe I can, I can just fake it my entire life and not have to deal with this. And this is, this is such a, a, a how, do we, how do we deal with this? Because God cannot heal what you don't reveal. So how do we, what's our, what's our response to this? Do we, have, do we have a role to play at all with, as far as hypocrisy when we see it in people's life? You guys know it. You guys are different people that you probably, maybe it's the guy in your small group. It's the buddy in the small group that he's, I mean, he goes to group with you. He attends most of them just like you. He, he dips in the same dip you do. He, he even prays when you guys pray. He even contributes to the discussion, yet he's cheating on his wife and it seems like everybody knows it. What do you do? It's that Christian kid, or at least he comes to discovery youth, kids. He comes to discovery youth, and, and he, he, he's one thing here, but then at school, he's cheating on his tests and chasing girls and acting different. Like, what do you do? Do you not do anything? What's the role we, that we play? Maybe it's your boss who speaks spiritual things. He even goes to a church, but he treats his employees terribly and operates his business without integrity or without ethics. What do you do? What do you do? Do we have any role to play in all of this? Maybe it's a friend of yours. He's on, maybe he's on even your serve team, your dream team. And he's constantly bashing other people, constantly talking about what Christians do and Christians are this, Christians are that, and not knowing that, it, that he's engaging himself in hypocrisy because he's gossiping. What do you, do we just, so what do we do? What's our response? Do we just kind of sit back and pray? Do we be non-confrontational? Do we do, we do something? What is our role in all of this. And I, I want to start with this idea of how do we love the hypocritical person? How do we deal with the hypocritical people in our, in our life in a loving way? What is God's response to it? I want to first start off with why are they acting this way? Let's look at it. Why, why are they acting this way? Because why they are behaving this way will determine how we respond to it. Okay, that's really important, you guys. Listen, let me say it again. Why they're acting this way determines how you and I should respond. And they're acting this way. When you see people acting maybe in, in what seems to be hypocritical ways, they're probably acting that way for three different reasons. Let me give them to you. Write them down. The first reason is possibly this. Maybe they really don't know God. Maybe, maybe they're not a hypocrite. Maybe they're just not even a believer. Maybe they're not even born again. It's not that they're a hypocrite. They're just not a believer. In fact, First John chapter 2 says that if anyone says, I know him but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. See, just because someone attends church does not make them a Christian. They can be in the same row as you. It doesn't mean they're a, a Christian, you guys. I heard one preacher say, just, you know, coming to church does not make me a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes me a car. Okay? So, so it, it's not, in fact, Jesus says that for those who, continue please, Jesus says in Matthew, Thank you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So what, is, what, do, we, what do we do here when there's this, when there's this seeming, well, the Bible is, look, maybe they're not a hypocrite. Maybe they just don't even believe yet, especially here at Discovery, because here at Discovery, we say you can belong before you even believe. So you may be looking at someone going, oh man, look at, look at, I can't believe that they're allowing and they are, and they are, and you don't even know that person ain't even born again. See why they are acting that way determines how we respond. That person doesn't need rebuke and correction. They need the grace of Jesus. Amen. That's what they need. They need the grace of Jesus Christ. They're not a hypocrite. Okay. So here's the second reason why maybe, you know, let's, because why they're doing it determines how we respond. Here's the second reason. Maybe they just don't know better yet. Maybe they don't know better yet. See, why are they behaving this way? Maybe they're new in the faith. Maybe they've never been taught how to live a faith life. Maybe they've never been taught how to assume new habits and take off old habits. Maybe they've never been taught how to walk out their faith in the life of the Spirit. 
Paul was actually addressing this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Amongst a lot of complicated issues, this was one of the issues he was addressing. He said, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people, check this out, who are still worldly. Mere, look what he calls them though, infants in what? In Christ. He goes, look, you're Man, you're forgiven. You've, you've been forgiven by Jesus, man. You're set free. You've accepted the grace and the forgiveness. But I wish I could talk to you about the deeper truths, about some more mysteries, about the kingdom of God and the life and the spirit. But man, you're, you're not ready for that yet. You're not ready for it yet. See, these people don't need rebuke or correction. This category of people don't need correcting. They need instructing. So this isn't the hypocrite. This is someone who's an infant in Christ. How you treat the baby is different than you cheat, treat the toddler and, and the, the 10 year old, isn't it? So this person, they're not a hypocrite, they're just new in the faith. They're an infant in Christ. This was me when I was 13 and accepted Jesus Christ. I had an authentic encounter with Jesus. I, I, I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, was even baptized, but check it out, I never got connected to a church. Never got connected to a group or a community of believers. Never was under any type of discipleship or equipping. I was, I, I just experienced it, got baptized even, and just went. So I actually was, was in high school that, that, that Christian who was at the party holding a beer and a joint. And then someone would use the Lord's name in vain, and that's when I become Christian. Hey, 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 now. Don't you... Don't you be, you know, using the Lord's name in vain around me. The only time I would even, the only time I would pray was, Lord, help me not get a DUI tonight, okay? I'm being honest. I don't know if that makes you feel better or not, that I'm your pastor now, okay? But I'm just being honest with you guys. Okay, so look, was I a hypocrite? Did I need correcting? What I needed was instructing is what I needed. See, the, the word of God that brings instruction would bring the correction I needed to my heart. And eventually, eventually, the word of God would bring. I would get under discipleship eventually and understand the word. And that instruction of God's word would change my heart and cause transformation. Amen. See, maybe they're not a hypocrite. Maybe they're just new in their faith. Maybe they're just a baby in Christ. They don't, need, they don't need your judgment. They don't need your correction. They need you to come alongside and give the instruction of the word of God. The author of Hebrews actually goes on, talks about these infants as well, but from a different angle. He says, we have much to say about this. Again, man, I want to tell you more, but you ain't ready yet, guys, because this is hard to make clear to you because you, look at this, you no longer try. He says, man, I wish I could tell you more. I wish I could take you further into the things of God. But somewhere along the way, Christian, you stopped trying. You stopped growing. Somewhere along the way, Christian, you just said, this far is far enough. This is good enough. I mean, I, mean, I can't be like that or like that. I'm never going to be like that. So right here is about as far in my faith and my walk of Christ. At least I'm not like them and I'm not like them. And here is fine. You no longer try. And Paul says, man, I wish I could teach you more. Man, I wish, but you're just, you're, you no longer try to understand. In fact, though, by this time, you ought to be teachers. It's not for lack of hearing the word or being in church or being around it or having access to it. Just we no longer try. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. He says, man, you're like that grown man living in the basement. You should be, you should be out having your own job and home and family now, but you in diapers, grown man with a mustache, dude. Anyone who lives on milk being still, there's that word again, an infant. You're in Christ. You're not ready. You're not ready. It's, it, you're not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, the right things of God. And here's why you want to continue to try and grow. Because, because solid food, that's for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves, look at this, to distinguish good from evil. See, that, that, that infant, when, we're, when we said this far is enough and we stop trying to try and we, and we say as an infant in Christ, that's the reason why your relationships keep getting broken and messed up and things ain't working out, this ain't working out. Why? Why do you keep getting tripped up? Because you don't know how to distinguish good from evil. We're still sucking on milk when God says, I got some. And even then, even then, Paul is like, that's not the hypocrite, man. You're still, okay, good job. Good job. Here's some milk. 
They're not, okay, so that's not the hypocrite. This third category is where we need to focus on. This here is the definition of hypocrisy. They know better, but they still disobey God. This is the hypocrite, and this is what we need to discuss today. They know better, but they still disobey God. Peter addressed it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2. Are you guys with me? Are you guys with me today? Okay, amen. Not hurting you too bad. All right, I love you, church. I love you. Okay, for you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. So, so where we say, you know what? Don't you? He's saying, Peter's saying, don't use the grace of God to, to cover up you doing what you want to do with your life. Right. Oh, well, I'm forgiven anyway, and, and God's not going to judge me. Don't you judge me. And, and it's easy to slip into the spirit of hypocrisy. And it starts really like, like hey, nobody's, nobody's perfect. Hey, it's nobody's business anyway. Nobody's perfect, and it ain't nobody's business anyway. I mean, I'm forgiven. God's going to forgive me anyway. Jude chapter 1 says like this, for certain individuals, they pervert, literally twist, distort the grace. God has grace. This is unmerited, undeserved favor. Gosh, he has so much grace for us, you guys. But there are some, he says, that kind of twist it. They pervert it, pervert the grace of our God into a license of immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. God's grace covers it. Uh, they, they, oh, I'm covered by God's grace, though, so they'll rationalize their behavior. They justify their decisions. Maybe someone who says, you know what? Maybe someone's addicted to pornography, and they try to justify, well, it's okay. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not hurting anybody. And if my wife were to just satisfy me like she's supposed to, or if I were satisfied in my relationship, or you know what? I'm not married, and I want to burn with lust, so this is okay, and this is, this is okay. And we rationalize our behavior. Maybe it's the person who says, you know what? I'm not materialistic. I just like nice things. Like nice things, but 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 you're not living this the way that God says. I want to bless you so that you can be a blessing. And you're not generous. You're not giving. You just like nice things, and it's a cover up for materialism. I'm not material. I just I just like. I don't have a problem with whatever anger, criticism. No one's perfect anyway. Who are you to judge me? Who are you? To, who are you to judge me? Peter says, don't do it. Don't use your freedom as a license to live any way you want to live. So what is what is what does Jesus want us to do in these situations with this third category of people? What would God, now I know like, I'm not asking what you want to do. I'm not asking what you would prefer to do. That's not, that's not what we're studying today. What we're studying is what does God call us as followers and slaves of Jesus Christ? What does he call us and want us to do with anyone who is, knows, the, knows better, but is willfully dishonoring and disobeying God? This is so important, you guys, that we get this right. It is extremely important because if we get this wrong, we can push people further away from God, right? And the way that we respond to it can just push people, make them feel condemned and judged. Or, or even, you know what, even the people looking on, right? Because there's, there's people looking on at the church going, ah, oh, look at the church, it's just hypocrisy. And that person's in your group and you just like, no, let's all just fake it. Let's all just, you know, you know it's there. Let's just not address it. Let's all just put on a mask right now. It's okay, brother. All right, sister, God bless you. And you know, you know what's going on. Do you have a role? What is our role? Should we just, should we be non-confrontational? Should we just pray like crazy and say, Holy Spirit, do your thing. You're the only one who can do it, God, which is part of it. You're right. Or should we, should we be all up in their business and be like, you shouldn't do and you should do. How do we respond? Because how we respond is so important. Because if you respond, if we get this wrong, you could hurt them. You could, you, could, you could hurt the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ by the onlookers. You can even hurt yourself and damage your relationships by responding wrong. How does God want us to respond and love hypocritical people? Okay, I want to give you three responses based upon God's word. Prayerfully respond that we need to prayerfully confront hypocritical people. The people that know better but still disobey God. Here it is. Start with this prayer. Number one, God, help me to confront with the goal of restoration. See, that's the goal. Your heart in the matter matters. Your motivation for confrontation matters. It matters how I confront and the motive of my confrontation. My goal must be restoration of the person. Galatians chapter six says it this way. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome 
by sin. Here it is. Here's the instruction. Not what you want, not what my opinion is. What does God want us to do in these situations? If we have a brother or a sister overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. See what happened. They, got, they just wandered away a little bit. And God says, what we're here to do is say, no, no, no. Come on, let me gently guide you back. Here's the metaphor. You're not the judge. You're the guide. You're not the judge. You don't get to slam the gavel and say what's right or wrong. Here's, here's, here's the principle. Your goal is not to be right. Your goal is to help someone else be right with God. That's the goal. It's not to prove yourself as right or superior to another person. Your goal is to restore somebody in their relationship with God. I had a friend who was actually a leader in, in ministry, and he came from a legalistic background. And, people, and, and because of that, it caused him to, to, to live out his freedom in ways that he wasn't allowed to before in ministry and as a leader, but he would talk with, with vulgarity and, and, some, and jokes and watch certain things and gave license to certain things. And he would even be, you know, there are other people who tried to correct him in a very, hey, you know, condemning way, and he just defensively rejected it. But this is my friend and my brother in Christ. And, and I went up to him with a different tactic, a different goal than you're right, I'm right, you're wrong. And I said, brother, I know you love God. I know you love God. And you want to help people deepen a relationship with God and introduce people to this loving God. And I know that you would not willingly cause someone to, to stumble in any way. And I know you've heard this before, but I'm just, I'm just I want to tell you, will you pray, pray about the words that you're using in the company that you're choosing. Will you pray? pray. Look, hey, I, and I told him like this, look, bro, I'm with you, man. I'm with you no matter what. I'm, I'm on your side, on your team. We're gonna advance this kingdom together for the rest of our life. No matter what God tells you, whatever he tells you, just know I'm with you. But here's what I want you to do. Can you, maybe you heard it from others, but just go to God and see what God thinks. Not what men think, but go to God, see what he thinks, man. And I just want you to know, I'm with you. And so he went to God and talked about it and, and actually changed his behavior in a lot of ways. And he actually even thanked me for bringing the information to him the way that I brought it. Why? Check this out. Because truth without grace is mean. And every, just, you're all truth. Blah, blah, blah. Now you, 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 you got no grace. That's mean, man. But grace without truth is meaningless. But truth and grace together is medicine. You think about how Jesus loved people, right? How did Jesus love people? He, he came full of grace and Truth, that's the way Jesus, he, Jesus, he was full of grace and truth. Think about the woman who was caught in adultery, who was brought before Jesus. What if Jesus, in that story, what if Jesus actually just was all grace, no truth? What if he was like, I don't worry about it, just don't get caught next time, girl, get out, get out of here, go do your business. That would have been bad, right? What if, Jesus, what if Jesus was all truth and no grace, you dirty, rotten sinner? You should get stoned. You better repent in front of all these people right now and change, you dirty. That would have been bad, right? No, no, he didn't do that. What the Bible says Jesus did, he, he knelt down when they brought her before. They brought her before Jesus. What do you, what do you say we should do? They're all ready to stone this, this woman, all these men. He kneels down and he starts to write in the sand. We don't know what he wrote, but a lot of scholars believe that he was writing the sins of the men who were trying to stone her because one by one, these men leave. One by one, until it's just Jesus and the woman sitting there. And, and, and she looks up and he says, woman, where are your, those who accuse you? And she says, they're not here. And in grace, he says, neither do I condemn you. And then in truth, he says, now get up, go and be free. Go and sin no more. Full of grace and truth. God help me confront. This is, God help me to confront with the goal of, of restoration. Humbly and gently as Galatians says. And then the rest of Galatians, that verse one says like this. Hey, confront humbly and gently to try to get them back on that right path. And be careful though, he says. Be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So here's the second prayer. God, help me to confront carefully. Help me to confront carefully. Um, you want to be very, very, very careful because the moment that you put yourself in the corrective standpoint that you are now uh, correcting somebody else, you are susceptible and vulnerable to pride. And what does the Bible say about pride? Pride comes before the what? Pride comes before the fall. 
So we need to be careful that any time that we're bringing correction, that we don't get to this self-righteous superiority because the Bible says that you, that's why I think Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So it's, it's at that moment where, you're, where you want to bring correction, you need to be careful because at that moment, you are the most susceptible and vulnerable to the enemy whispering in your ear, you would never do that. Oh, look how ungodly they are. Oh, man, they're so, no, you would never, and, and, and you're so much better than that, and my goodness, I can't believe they, and, and it make you, like the, the, the prayer of the, the religious person in the synagogue, remember he was, the sinner was beating his chest, and the synagogue ruler said, oh, thank God I'm not like this sinner. That's the hypocrite, and you got to be careful that when you're bringing correction with the goal of restoration, that you be careful that you don't fall yourself because of pride. I experienced this in ministry some years ago at a, a different church, there was a, a couple that came that was living a gay lifestyle. And I celebrated it. And I was like, what? This is amazing that they're coming to the church. And the church was very traditional. And the um, church was honestly was just not an, an openly friendly church to those who are living those lifestyles. But I hear I am. I celebrate it. Man, I'm like, this is amazing. But there was one of these leaders on the uh, 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 that actually didn't celebrate it. He he saw it as a like an, an, a toxin coming into the body of Christ, going to inf- like it was an infection, not worthy of celebration. This was infection, and oh, we we can't accept this because it's gonna it's gonna spread. And and I mean, I just it ate me up, guys. It got me so frustrated at the. Are you kidding me? This is so. How are you gonna hold someone who doesn't live for God, doesn't believe in your God, or believe in your Bible to that standard? Are you? kidding me for anyone who's wondering what does discovery believe now what is going on look i believe that god ordained marriage be one man one woman i believe that 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 lifestyle of homosexuality is a sin but i'm gonna tell you this people can belong here before they believe everything that i believe and no matter what your sin is or your issue is or your stronghold is you will be loved you will be accepted i'm gonna hug you i may even kiss you i mean i don't look that's hypocrisy. And I mean, I just ate me up. I said, that just doesn't seem right, man. There were, what is, what is, but anyway, it, they eventually left. They eventually left because they were, did not feel welcome or accepted there at all. And the, the crazy thing is, is just several years later, this leader who was saying, oh, sexual sin and homosexual sin, especially, you've got to be careful. Uh, sexual sin needs to be treated differently in the church. And man, you've got to be careful that several years later he he was asked to resign because he was cheating on his wife so what am i saying man you got to be careful when you when you confront with that goal because you become susceptible yourself you, you are most vulnerable yourself because you're the enemy will say you're better than and anytime you start to think you're better than you are you are most susceptible to a fall so how do we do this how do we confront carefully with the heart to restore. I didn't put it in your notes or anything, but let me give you a summary of Matthew chapter 18. I'm gonna give you a summary of it just really quickly. We practice this here at Discovery. We practice what Jesus said on how to restore and how to reconcile. It's not about what I feel good or what you feel good, what your opinion is. It's about what God says. God says Matthew, in Matthew 18, how we are to respond and restore. So let me give you the summary. In Matthew chapter 18, if you wanna write it down and read it later, I encourage you to do that. He says, Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins against you, that right there ought to tell you, you don't hold non-Christians to your Christian standard. You don't go confront your coworkers who don't believe and tell them how bad they're cursing and stuff like that. And they ought to, no, my goodness, stop it. That's not the confrontation that Jesus wants you to, to be in. He says, if your brother or sister sins against you, then what does he say? I want you to go to him, he says, on your own. Go to him one on one. In the Greek, you look that up, it means not on Twitter. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't mean that. But that's the most embarrassing, dumbest thing you can do to try to air out your issues and your gripes and your complaints and the sins of other people on social media or other people instead of going directly to your brother or your sister, seeking to understand. And by the way, because he says, um, if someone sins against you, go to them one on one, that implies a relationship. That's a relationship. I have relational equity with them. I have a relationship with this person that I actually know that they are either new in the faith, or they're an infant in Christ, if they're even a believer or not, where they're at on the spectrum of this thing so I can actually bring the proper instruction or correction 
into their life. I'm not going to just judge them from afar and then go, oh, yeah, I need to correct that. Oh, I need to correct. And some of you think it's your job to correct everybody's issues and stuff like that. You need to go listen to critical people again, okay? That's not what I'm talking about here in, in this issue of confrontation. It's a relationship that I have. It's a brother or sister that has sin in their life or even has offended me. I'm going to go to them one-on-one. -on -one. And then he says this. Jesus says, if he listens, you've won them over. Praise God, you've won them over. But then he says, if he doesn't listen, I want you to take another person. See, so he said, another person, you go with another. One other person that's a respected person. It's someone who has relational equity in that person's life. It's someone who knows God and living for God. Here you go, bring another person. The goal is restoration. The goal is to help your brother and your sister, not to just play like everything's fine, have them over your house for dinner, you have them go on play dates and stuff, and you're knowing everything is not fine. At some point, you got to say, I'm not playing that game, bro. Bro, I love you too much to play that game. And if they don't listen to you even then, Matthew 18, this is Jesus. This is Jesus, okay? This is the model of reconciliation according to Jesus, not according to me. This isn't my model. Jesus says, if they still don't listen, take it to the church. And I'm not talking about at the altar or anything like that. What that means is you get a leader involved now. It could be the small group leader. It could be the, the pastor that you serve with or under the director or someone. You get a leader involved. And the goal again, the goal is restoration. It's not correction. And some of you are thinking like, man, this is tough. Well, Jesus goes on to say, if they still don't listen, you got to reorganize that relationship. Redefine it. He says, if they still don't listen, actually treat them like a tax collector. And some of you think, man, that is really harsh. I promise you, this isn't harsh. This is love in action. It's not, it's not, pretending like everything is okay. Oh, I'm just going to pretend and let them destroy their life and be beguiled by Satan and, and destroy their kids and their marriage and let's just not mess with it. That's not love. That is not love, guys. And neither, neither is this. Oh, did you see? Did you know what so-and-so did? That's not love either. It's, it's love is this goal, this gentle, humble, my sister, I love you and I see what's going on and, I, and you know better and God has so much better. It's gently and humbly leading them to a better path, a better freedom, a better life in Christ. That is love. And that's what God has called us to do. You can clap and give God praise if you want to. So what do we do? We got to get this right, church. We have to get this right. Can't just play games, man. You know, maybe maybe they're not even a believer. Okay, that's maybe they're not. Maybe maybe they are, but they're new in the faith. But maybe they know better, and they're just willingly disobeying God. What do we do? We humbly and gently, with grace and truth, restore that person, guide that person. We're not. We don't save anybody. Jesus saves. Okay, only the Holy Spirit can draw people to Him. But God can, as I humbly and gently, I can be a help to guide them. And then number three, here's the important last step. We got to recognize when I'm the hypocrite. You thought you were getting off easy today, huh? He said, oh, aren't we talking about everybody else? No, hold on, hold on. We got to recognize when we ourselves become the hypocrite. See, Jesus called the hypocrites. He said, you blind fools. But you know why? Because it's so easy to see when other people are being hypocrites. But it's so hard to look in the mirror and see it within ourselves when we are engaging in hypocrisy. And I think that all of it, like what Aristotle said, Aristotle was quoted with saying this here. He says, it's better to be known as a sinner than known as a hypocrite. And I think a lot of us feel that who are in Christ, those that know Christ, you know, a lot of you go, feel like, I don't want to be known as a hypocrite, so I'm going to put up some guardrails. So I want to define this a little bit more for you today. Um, what does it mean to be a hypocrite? Because in Matthew chapter six, Jesus went on and said, look, this is what hypocrites do. Don't be like that. He said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen, to be seen that by them. And he says, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. And then when you pray, don't be like the hypocrite for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, talking all fancy to be seen by others. He says, you know what? I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. Nothing else is coming to them. Nothing else is coming to them. See, when you read that, and I think a lot of you who are in Christ, you have such a fear of being hypocrisy. What Aristotle said is absolutely true. You'd rather be called a sinner than a hypocrite. So what we do is we don't, we don't, because Jesus also said this. Jesus said, let your good deeds shine before all. Let it be a, let it be like a lamp on a hill that people would see your good deeds and praise your heavenly father. Okay, so 
God does want you to still do good deeds. And some of you are like, oh, I can't let people know the good that I'm doing. I can't take a snapshot of me serving at the Dream Center because then people will think I'm a, I'm a hypocrite and I can't pray out loud or anything like that because, because people will think I'm a hypocrite. No, that's not what hypocrisy is. Look, this is hypocrisy has to do with your motive and your mask. That's that if look, yes, please continue to serve, continue to do good deeds and give to the needy, but check your motive. Are you doing it so that you can be seen by men as holy or righteous or good or better? Or are you doing it for the right reason to glorify your God in heaven? What is your motive? What's behind the mask? It's easy. It's easy to slip into a hypocritical spirit. It's, it is. It's, and, and what I found out is whatever you're the most condemning about is oftentimes um, where you are susceptible the most. Whatever you're the most condemning is a reflection of where you're most vulnerable. So if you judge an area or a sin or an issue extremely harshly more than others, then it's probably because that issue for you is an issue. So if you're judging people because of the money and the way they use money and the way they, they're not using money, it's because you probably have an unhealthy view of money. Or if you're judging people for what they're dressed like and what they're looking like, they shouldn't be dressing like that, revealing this and that. Maybe it's because you have a lust issue yourself. See, wherever you're judging the most or critical the most often reveals where you are the most vulnerable. David, King David learned this in the Old Testament. There was a time in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel explains when the king should have been at war, David was not at war. He was actually up, you know, just strolling on top of his roof. And some of you know this story, but he sees a woman named Bathsheba taking a bath. And he lusts after her. She's a married woman, but he says, I don't care. I'm good. You know, I'm the king and I'm the friend of God. And, and so he invites her into his bed, sleeps with her, but he gets her pregnant. He says, you know what? One, let me cover it up some more. Let me put on some more masks. He has the husband come home, tries to get her to sleep with her. Long story short, he doesn't. So he sends the husband to the front lines to be killed. And here he is afterwards going, whew, whew, dodge that one. Still good, people. I'm still good until Nathan, the prophet, comes along and says, D David, let me tell you a story. There was once a rich guy who owned a lot of sheep and cattle and goats and a whole bunch of stuff. And he owned a bunch of them. And then under his care was also this really poor family, this poor guy. And he had for this young lamb from a little age, man. And then the lamb would sleep with them. The kids loved the lamb. It was like they're like a part of the family, man, this lamb. One day, a rich man started traveling through, and this rich ruler did not feed him with his own cattle and his own herd and his own goat. He actually went to the poor guy's house, grabbed that little goat from that family, slaughtered it, killed it, and fed it to the rich guy. And David hears this and goes, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. That is terrible. I can't. Look what he says. He says, David burned with anger against the man. And he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He ought to pay. He's going to pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you're the hypocrite, bro. You are that man. You're the hypocrite. David couldn't even see because it's so blinding. Hypocrisy is that he was judging someone and condemning someone for the very sin that he himself was committing. So here's the, here's the key. Here's the key to it all, you guys. That What we need to do is choose authenticity over hypocrisy. And I want you to know, everyone that's here today, please hear me. It's okay to not be okay. Here at Discovery Church, it is okay to not be okay. There is no reason to wear the mask. That mask is not helping you. It's hurting you. It's preventing you from receiving the healing that God desires in your heart and in your life. It is absolutely okay to not be okay. See, everybody wants the truth, but nobody wants to be honest. One of the metaphors about who we are as people that Jesus liked to use, and it's not a flattering meta metaphor, but he called us sheep. And it's not flattering because sheep are the most stupidest animals there are almost that ever lived, okay? They're just dumb. They wander off easily. They follow shiny objects. They, they wander. That's what sheeps do. They wander. They need a shepherd. They need a sheepdog. They need to be corralled all the time. All, sheep just wander off a little bit. And James chapter 5 says it like this. What do we do? What's our role, you guys? How do we love the hypocritical person? How do we, how do we 
deal with that within our own life, in our own groups, in our own ministries, in our own friends? How do we, how do we do it? If one of you should wander like a sheep, just kind of, that's just what we do. It's what we do, okay? We're going to wander. It's going to happen. But if you should wander from the truth and someone should gently, humbly guide and bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. See, this, this is what love looks like. I know it's hard. I know for some of you, confrontation is not easy. For some of you, it's too easy. Some of you got too much candor and you need more care, okay? Some of you got a lot of truth and you need more grace. Some of you got a lot of grace and you need more truth. You need both truth and grace to gently and humbly guide the people that are around you and in your life that are wandering. That's how we love them. That's how we love the hypocritical people. Can I pray for you? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. God, we just need your help in this area. 